What's up, guys? Who in here was at Reg's talk? Awesome. And you guys all thought it was absolute bullshit, right? <laughs> all right, good. All right, so, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm Tyler Wrightson. Let's, uh, let's get this party started. Damn it. Oh, I love that. He says, uh, I, th I heard it before. Let's see if we get to replay. Who are you and why should I care? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm uh, Tyler Wrightson. I'm the founder of Lead Cybersecurity. We're based out of Albany, New York. All we do is penetration testing, offensive security. That's it, nothing else. We don't remediate issues. Uh, I've written two books, one on wireless network security, one on offensive security, in which I propose that uh, a specific individual can acquire the skills necessary in a very short period of time to be able to hack into any organization. And I stand by that. And I think soon I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and train somebody from scratch. But anyway, uh, you know, uh, why you want to listen to me is because I eat, sleep, and breathe security. It really is what I love. And, uh, you know, even if I uh, retired tomorrow, I would still do this. We have an awesome team at, at uh, Elite. Uh, this is actually a picture of our team. <laughs> and uh, we have a growing team as well. So if any of you guys, uh, you know, are looking for... Uh, Full-time work or even uh, contracted work, reach out to me because uh, we are looking for new people. Uh, anyone seen any of my talks before? No one? You're all new? Awesome. So I despise interaction. If anyone speaks out at all, I will stab you. <laughs> all right. No, I'm joking. I actually like the exact opposite. You're here. You know what I mean? You can, you can watch videos online, and so you should take advantage of the fact that you are here. And if you have any questions, comments, uh, you know, you'd like to rebut anything, Feel free to just shout out. Don't raise your hand, just shout it out. That's what I prefer. Um, and I have an awesome announcement to make. Uh, so Anycon, which is a uh, sponsor of uh, B-Sides, uh, we founded it this year. This is the first year of the conference. It's in Albany, New York, uh, June 16th through the 18th. Uh, Dave Kennedy is keynote speaking. Iron Geek's going to be there. We've got a huge hardware hacking village, an awesome capture the flag competition in which we're testing every area of skills. So. Come join us. Uh, it's going to be a great time. And I'm actually giving away two free tickets during this talk, as well as the CTF winners here are getting uh, free tickets to the con. So pay attention because I'm going to give away a couple, uh, couple things. And also we've got uh, cool, cool people sponsored. We've got like, free stuff from No Starch Press. Uh, South Ord is, is donating lock picks and things like that. So it's really just a conference to, to have fun and uh, you know, grow the community in the Northeast. Uh, we still need speakers, so if, if any of you guys uh, want to speak, you get a free ticket to the con. Um, and, you know, really want you guys there. Uh, we hold a, a security meetup in Albany called Side Beer Security. It's free and formal, uh, but uh, if you guys ever find yourselves in Albany, let me know. You can, uh, you can join us. So finally, why are we here? Why are you in this specific talk? Uh, so ultimately, I want to share some cool war stories with you guys. I've always loved uh, war story related talks to just hear how uh, other pen testers have experienced different challenges and cool findings that they have. You know, just uh, share some cool stories uh, and hopefully uh, give you some new techniques. Uh, I recently released some uh, tools that I spoke about previously, uh, things like LDAP or DAN, which is a uh, command line based uh, LDAP reconnaissance tool once you have uh, credentials or if it allows anonymous connections to enumerate a lot of really uh, good things that you can use in a pen test from an Active Directory LDAP uh, domain. Um, other things like uh, authenticating to OWA for, uh, for phishing campaigns and some other stuff. Uh, after this talk, once, uh, once I'm done with one of the engagements, because one of the engagements I'm going to talk about, I'm actually still in the middle of. So on Monday morning, uh, we're going to continue on with it. So you'll see where we're at right now. But I hope to release uh, a couple of the tools that we created, uh, as well as uh, hopefully a white paper even. So you can check out my uh, GitHub page there. <clears throat> so... Before we dive into the war stories, um, I always like to also talk about some of the interesting things that I've learned uh, in the recent past. So I'm still reading this book, and I highly recommend this book. It is so awesome. You know, we're big in the whole uh, samurai martial arts kind of thing, and uh, some of the, the specific things in here really stood out to me. Um, one of them is a story that I wish I had heard before I wrote the last book because I would have included it. Um, and it is, so the book is The Sword in the Mind. It's all about, uh, you know, uh, uh, swordsmanship and mastering the sword. And so one of the best stories in this book is about a master swordsman who's walking along through a village, and there is a boy being held hostage in a, in a barn. And so the master swordsman uh, stops, and he looks into the barn, and he guy's got the, uh, a sword to the little kid's neck. 
And so this master swordsman borrows a, a, a costume or you know the, the outfit from a from a Buddhist monk, and he approaches the door and he says, you know, it's it's been a few hours. You're in there with the kid. You you both must be very hungry. And the, the guy said, you know, don't take another step in here. If you do, I'm going to cut this kid's throat. And the guy says, fair enough. I just want you guys to be, to, to be able to eat. I know you've been in there for a long time. And so he, he, he uh, rolls up two rice balls. And, and again, he approaches the door and says, I have these two rice balls for you. And the guy says, if you come inside, I'm going to cut this kid's throat. And so the guy says, yes, I will, I will not come in. And he throws him the, the rice ball. And he, the, the, the guy lets go of the, the, the kid he's holding and catches it. And then the guy throws the other ice ball, and he drops his sword and catches it. And so he runs in, tackles the guy, and supposedly this is a real story. And uh, from that point on, he was like, uh, you know, considered one of the, the top uh, Buddhist swords masters. The, 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 sorry? Life-giving sword, was it? No. Actually, I don't know if it is. This does reference life-giving sword in, in some of it. Um, I have not read that book yet, but I cannot wait to read that book. Uh, so, yeah, I thought that was a really awesome story. And if you really... Uh, stop and think about it. Like what they're what they're really talking about is once you reach that upper echelon of understanding and mastery of your weapon, you can completely discard it. And that's one of the the number one things that they uh, talk about in this book is that to become the ultimate swordsman, uh, you need to learn to defend yourself against someone with a sword with no sword. It's really a, a cool concept. Let me turn that down. So again, I really like that. It was an awesome story. Again, another story in the book was about uh, a master swordsman who was uh, basically challenging people while he was on horseback. And uh, you know, he, was, he said no one can, can defeat him while he's on horseback. He's the best you know, mounted uh, swordsman. And so sure enough, there's you know, all these guys that are challenging him. And this one master swordsman that kept challenging him to face this guy and said, no, no, it's not worth it. And so finally, they convinced him. And, uh, and he rides up to the guy on, on, on horseback gives the nose, the, the nose of the horse, of his opponent's horse, a little tap. The horse starts reeling, and the guy has no control over the horse. And so sure enough, he just you know, knocks him off his horse. I thought it was a really cool, again, way of uh, looking at outside-of-the-box thinking. Right? I thought that was really cool. And then there's two really important concepts within, with, within this book that I thought were awesome. And one of them is about uh, obtaining uh, knowledge and mastery of, of anything. And uh, so I'll run through this really quick, and then I want to read a quick passage from the book. Uh, but it says, uh, to reach a house, you must first enter the gate. The gate is a pathway leading to the house. After passing through the gate, you enter the house and meet its master. Learning is the gate to re reaching the way. <clears throat> because learning is the gate, don't think that the books you read are the way. Books are a gate for reaching the way. And so th this is like a good example of how pithy but meaningful a lot of like these Asian texts can be. I, I just love that. That... Uh, the act of learning is just part of the process. And to get to that point where you have real wis wisdom, uh, you can essentially, uh, you know, you need to, to differentiate those two things. And so one of the other really awesome things in here is uh, this concept of exhausting all knowledge. And so I want to read this uh, really quick. Uh, so it says, uh, the great learning says, exhaust all knowledge and master everything. Exhausting all knowledge means knowing everything that is generally known in society and the principle of everything that exists, leaving nothing unknown. So I feel like I've gotten to that point myself. You know, I know everything in society. No, I'm all right. So, so this is a really, really interesting point. It says, while you don't know about something, you have doubts about it. Because you are doubtful, that something does not leave your mind. If the principle of that something becomes clear, nothing will remain in your mind. This is what is meant by exhausting all knowledge and mastering everything. And so to skip like three paragraphs and get to the bottom, it says, that is the ultimate end of all disciplines. The final state of any discipline is where you forget what you have learned, discard your mind, and accomplish whatever you set out to do without being aware of it yourself. You begin by learning and reach the point where learning does not exist. That's freaking awesome. And so in previous presentations, I quoted a uh, master, you know, grandmaster chess player. And I wish I could find him because I cannot find this quote. I'm just, I remember it from uh, reading about chess when I was really young. And he says that uh, to get to his level, it was always like learning individual tactics and techniques and steps was like climbing lungs on, uh, rungs on a ladder. And that once he reaches a, a new level, a new plateau, he was able to kick away the ladder because all of those specific things that he learned were, were meaningless and they didn't necessarily apply to him anymore. And so I felt like this was another really elegant way to talk about how in the beginning when you're learning things, and again, this, apply, this applies really well, in my opinion, towards hacking, 
um, that you know, it's a very concerted thing and you're learning about very specific things, but then you get to a specific point and it all just becomes clear and, and it, you stop worrying about that kind of stuff. So anyway, I thought that was awesome. Um, and final point from this book is something that uh, I'm still, um, I, I, think it greatly relate, I think it greatly relates to that last point uh, about uh, exhausting all knowledge, where they talk about this mind that never tarries or this mind that doesn't rest on anything in particular. And uh, so the, the examples they use to me are, are a little bit confusing. They talk about like touching a gourd on, on top of water or something like that. But, uh, but it goes perfectly in line with that, that once, once you have a mastery over something, your mind does not stick with that thing, and it's free to roam in that it's that roaming process that allows you to continue to be a master. It's, again, it's a very uh, uh, pithy but awesome uh, component. So anyway, read that book. It's freaking awesome. And uh, then, you know, ping me on twi Twitter or something and let me know uh, how you like it. All right, so let's, uh, let's get to the meat of this. Uh, these are my war stories, me and my team. My team has grown uh, 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 pretty large since uh, the last conversation or the last uh, talk I presented. So this is me and my team. Um, if you hear anyone else telling very similar stories, let me know so I can hunt them down and kill them. Uh, so we're going to go over four uh, specific tests that we were on. One was uh, physical infiltration at a healthcare organization. Two was uh, an external hybrid because we were using offensive skills, but it was in a very like staccato way. It was like, okay, test this. Okay, what did you find? Um, you know, ask the client for approval. Okay, go ahead, keep going. And it was part of a very, very large, uh, encompassing, all-encompassing test. And I cannot talk about the even the type of place because it'll give away uh, what they, who they, who they are, and uh, what they do. But let's just say they have. Uh, giant stockpiles of money. Uh, we're going to talk about, <laughs> we're gonna talk about uh, an external pen test that was completely open scope against a software company. And a really interesting one was, it, this is the one that we're currently doing right now, what, which is uh, breaking a thick client application. <coughs> All right, so let's, uh, let's uh, rock and roll. Uh, so the first one, uh, uh, physical pen test at a healthcare organization. Um, some of the talks I've given previously, we've, we've broken into extremely secure environments, uh, you know, basically uh, power plant monitors, um, where we came up with a whole pretext and disguised ourselves as FedEx and broke in and, you know, brought a huge pallet that was to simulate a bomb. This is not that situation. This is the exact opposite of that spectrum. And so when we do tests, we always want to gear it towards a specific client and the value that they can get out of it. And so the way we do that is that we simulate the threats that that organization is likely to face. So sure, maybe someday this specific healthcare organization will have somebody go through the entire hassle of setting up a pretext at you know, FedEx, delivering a thing, and yada yada, but they're very, very unlikely to face that. What they are likely to face is somebody off the street doing something stupid. You know, maybe they have some technical skills, but probably not. It's probably just somebody roaming around looking for uh, pharmaceuticals or easy money or walking away with a laptop, something like that. So we wanted to simulate that. And so we decided to break it up into two groups, two groups of two people, to simulate two subtly different uh, pretexts. One is uh, people dressed kind of nice, uh, you know, like consultants, uh, tie, sports jacket, whatever. And the other one was to simulate truly two idiots walking off the street, jeans, t-shirt, baseball cap, um, and see how far they could get. And so uh, we basically kind of drew straws uh, me and, and uh, you know, one of my guys uh, drew uh, the, the, the better one. We got the easier one, right? So we, we dressed as consultants, which, again, if anyone in here uh, has ever done any consulting, most physical security practices go out the window when they see somebody walking around in a, in a tie, and, oh, you don't need to check in, go on through. So anyway, we, we went in. Um, we entered through a, a side entrance. We did very, very minimal recon online. Normally, it's a big convoluted process, but again, we wanted to, to demonstrate what somebody with very limited knowledge would, would, would do. Um, so all we did was identify the major entrances, we entered through the side entrance, uh, went up all, everything was so beautifully labeled in this, you know, staircases and all this stuff, east, west staircase, and yada, yada. Uh, so we entered the staircase, uh, went to the second floor where there was a, a sensitive uh, departments of the business, go to open it, and it's locked, start walking, uh, I think we were even headed down at that point, um, and the door swings open, and this uh, guy goes, uh, you guys looking for something? We go, no, nope, we're good, uh, and we walked past him, and, uh, and that was it. 
There's literally no, no, no other uh, contact from that guy. So we were in the sensitive area because he just opened the door because he heard somebody jiggling the, the handle. So that was like a really good start of what was about to happen. Uh, so we're walking around through departments. A couple people, people asked us if we needed help. We basically said no uh, and continued on. Uh, we, we made it to the uh, uh, elevators, which were all uh, had uh, hid RFID cards uh, to go anywhere. Um, so we hit some buttons, nothing, nothing happens. But uh, in true adversary form, we tried every single button in there. And so sure enough, there was one labeled 7R, which is the rear of the elevator. And uh, it turns out, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they kind of knew about it, that that, for some reason, could not have uh, key cards to access that, that uh, location. And so we get up to the seventh floor. Uh, the rear of the elevator opens up, and we, we get out. And it's like this very small area. And uh, so we're, we're trying to see if it leads anywhere. And, uh, and I mean, like, super small. It's like, you know, this wide and maybe that, that long, and that's it. And the front of the elevator opens. And the guy goes, you guys lost? And we go, yeah, I definitely think we're lost. And, and, and he's like, where are you trying to get to? Some, and we say, seventh floor. He's like, oh, yeah, you got to go around this. There's like a little door over here. He's like, or you can come through this way. I'm like, all right, great, thanks. So we made it to the seventh floor, which was like a very restricted area, uh, walking around. Uh, so that was basically our experience. You know, we, we actually some other sensitive areas, but, uh, but that was it. And so for us, the real test was what will these, uh, you know, people that, that look like any Joe Schmo off the street, what will, what, will their, what will their experience be? And we gave them uh, one... So I call them uh, uh, legitimacy triggers. Uh, we gave them one prop that they could use. I'll let you guys guess in a second what it was. But basically, they had more success than we did. And they were dressed, I wish I had pictures of them, because it was literally like t-shirt and jeans, one guy had a Yankees hat on, and one guy had like a beanie on. And they're just, they're just walking around, and they gained access to way more than we did. We literally had timed it so that we could all sit down with the client um, and, and kind of review the physical security findings that we identified right then and there. And uh, they were gone for the entire meeting because they were having too much fun, like trying to hit every single room in this building. Um, so anyone want to guess what the, uh, what the prop was? Incredible. Yes, that's exactly what it was. Uh, so see me afterwards, I'll give you one of the free ticks any kind, as long as you can make it. Otherwise, can you, do you think you can make it June? What is it? June 16th, 8th through the 18th. Albany? All right, cool. Free ticket. Uh, so yeah, it's funny. But that's literally all it takes in a lot of cases is something as stupid and trivial as that. Sometimes it's a printed, printed shirt with something that says something like security. Sometimes it's a clipboard. Sometimes it's a, uh, a thing that looks like their badges that has nothing on it. Uh, but that's all it takes. And, and so they got the same exact questions. Um, uh, you know, are you guys lost or, or what are you here for? They answered with one thing and then they were good. And, and, and they could move on freely. Um, so the unique thing about that, again, is that we weren't trying to be sophisticated. We wanted to know how their people, their processes, their security guards, their controls would hold up against an unsophisticated threat because that's what they were likely to face. Uh, so yeah, that was, uh, that was a good one. Any, uh, any other questions about that one? Um, is the term legitimacy, the legitimacy trigger, is, is that is trademark you coming up? Or? Yeah. Oh. It's not actually trademark, but yeah, I can't remember. Gotcha. Um, cool, good question. Okay, so Lotus is not the company. This was to jog my memory in case I forgot which one I want to talk about. Um, so this was uh, that, uh, uh, it was actually uh, external and internal and all these other components for this specific client, but we found something very uh, interesting uh, when we did the external piece. Uh, so like always, um, our uh, research on this organization starts with, with very in-depth reconnaissance. And so we have a very specific methodology uh, define about everything that we do every single time to make sure that we hit as much reconnaissance data as possible. One of those includes looking at breach data. Anybody ever do that as part of a pen test? Look at uh, all the, the breaches. I mean, there's tons now. Ashley Madison, uh, Yahoo. There, there's tons of these smaller ones too. So we stockpile them and we search for the target organization's name and especially their email address. Uh, so anyone familiar with the Adobe breach uh, in 2013? You are? Okay, cool. I'm seeing a couple head nods. Uh, so ultimately, it was roughly 10 gigabytes. I think, it, I think that was the, un, the uncompressed uh, size. And roughly, you know, originally they come out with numbers that were like way lower. It was like a couple million, then 33 million, then 150 million accounts as part of this breach. 
And there are some other really, really uh, interesting components to this breach. And I highly recommend that all of you research that breach afterwards for a dozen reasons. Uh, but just go read about it, and uh, you'll find some cool stuff. Anyone know what the particularly unique thing about the passwords in the Adobe breach? Anyone know what the deal was with those? Nope. Not that they were insulted. Any other guesses? They were encrypted. Yeah. So, huge snafu. Anyone know why that's such a bad thing to do? To encrypt passwords? There you go, exactly. That's why we use hashing, because it's not reversible. Sure, you can brute force it, but then it's dependent on the password. Encryption, if I have the encryption key, I just decrypt all of the passwords. So, on that note, it's interesting because there was a lot of research done on what the actual encryption algorithm could be, uh, the key, the, the, the mode, all of that. And, and as far as I understand, no one actually ever figured out the encryption algorithm. But because from a few stupid choices they made as well, we can infer more information about the passwords. And even more important than the uh, encrypted form of the password was there was another component as part of this leak. Anyone? Want to guess what that was? Hint. Who said it? Hint. Yes, the password hint. So I highly recommend you go download this and look at some of the hints. It is eye-opening. So basically, we found roughly 150 users that were at this organization that were a part of this breach. And so we looked at all of their password hints. And because all of these are encrypted and not salted, so again, two different technologies, but if it were a hash and salted, this would not apply. But because it were encrypted, all of the users that had the same encrypted password had the same, that use the same password had the same encrypted text. So all we have to do is say, okay, this user has this, this encrypted password, show me everyone with that encrypted password, and let's look at all of those hints together. And you would be really surprised at the number that we can just basically reverse engineer slash guess based on the password hints. So a lot of the things were like, password is password. Or it would be, uh, you know, dog's name plus one. And then it would be buddy plus number. It's like, okay, so maybe it's the dog's name is buddy, the number is one, we try that. So the interesting thing is that out of that 140, we found seven users. And this was, uh, mind you, uh, the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, that had not changed their passwords in three years to this uh, Lotus email system. So now we had access to uh, seven users' email, uh, emails and passwords to log in and start getting sensitive data that way. But because it's a Lotus system, we also checked for this. Anyone know what the deal is with this? See something laughing? Yes, it's a directory of all the accounts in that Lotus email system. Do you know if there are any other vulnerabilities that were ever in this? Yes, it does. So now we have the entire directory and all of the uh, hashed passwords for everyone in this organization based on breach data from 2013. Uh, so this was a big, big headache. I, at the time, um, I, I think it might have been brought into Hashcat at this point, but at the time, that specific hashing algorithm was only uh, available in John the Ripper. And so it took a lot of uh, mucking around because it was also like a, it was a specific patch that was only uh, by default uh, utilized in a specific version of JTR. So uh, I will probably uh, post this somewhere at some point just to save somebody some, some headaches. Uh, but we were able to basically brute force a ton of their passwords, uh, all again stemming from, uh, from that breach data. So why was this unique? Uh, we've utilized other breaches before uh, this was the one that I think was very kind of like, you know, head on, uh, uh, hand on your, your, uh, your forehead kind of thing. Because it was like, you had three years to just force your users to change their password once, and this might not be an issue at all. Uh, so we thought that was, uh, that was pretty unique how, how, how bad that was. Um, so any, any other questions related to that one? All right, so uh, this is external pen test at a software company um, where they said that they, had, they, they said that they get annual penetration tests done 
as required by Google because they develop software for Google. And when I asked him what types of results they got from previous pen tests, and I hear BS answers like, oh, you know, the typical, like, you know, uh, cert issues and SSL issues, and I'm like, oh, like, I'm like, we're going to wreck this company. Um, if that, because clearly what that was was a company scanning them with a vulnerability scanner, printing it out, and saying, there you go, we weren't able to do anything. And so this is one of those things that uh, really helped highlight the difference in, in my mind and, and in the client's mind, the difference between a vulnerability assessment and a penetration test. It's a very expensive list to sell time to So, as usual, it starts with reconnaissance. Uh, enumerated as much uh, of the technical infrastructure as well as the human infrastructure uh, for this organization. Uh, as part of that, we identified some web applications that they hosted that uh, were exposed to the internet. We could register for, for accounts, uh, generic user accounts, on those applications and gain access to them without any type of manual authorization. Uh, so we did that. We're poking around. We identified uh, only one system that had uh, a SQL injection vulnerability, we were able to dump the entire database, including the, the user table. Um, so we saw a bunch of users at this target organization that had credentials in the system. So like, okay, let's, let's go about trying to crack those. Um, we have a pretty awesome uh, password cracking rig. It's uh, six GPUs, I think, uh, right on 9600 or something like that. Um, so at ridiculous speed, we were able to crack all potential. There was MD5, they were unsalted. Um, and we were able to, to exhaust the uh, eight character upper lower special key space within uh, I think like two or three days. And we, we were at that point, we cracked about half of the people at the target organization and a couple of them were, were mentioned online as administrators and marked in here as like a, an admin role. So we took that and we said, okay, let's see if they reuse these passwords anywhere. And so they had uh, Google hosted email. So we log in their email poking around, looking for keywords like VPN, remote, password. We found a bunch of interesting stuff, uh, but not as much as we usually do. Some of the most interesting stuff we found, which isn't typical, is that we found a lot of uh, SSH-related uh, key data. So it wasn't necessarily um, private keys, uh, but it was information about authenticating to SSH uh, on some of the servers they hosted, but they were not accessible to us. Um, so we said, okay, let's, uh, let's take these credentials and log into other of their web-related assets and see if that gets us anywhere. And so we logged into one system, which we had also created uh, a user account on, but now that we logged in with an admin, it gave us new functionality. And so again, without giving too much information away, uh, you're able to run jobs against data. And there was a... It was built into the, into the web interface, but uh, not necessarily displayed by default, which allowed them to essentially debug that job, which was run in Python or another language, which, which is very uncommon, so I'm not going to say it. Um, so anyone see any issues with that? No one? Feel it? Python from web interface? Anyone ever exploit that? All right, I so see you half a head nod. All right, cool. Well, then, great. It's super easy. And so basically, we said, okay, it looks like this admin account can execute arbitrary Python code. Let's see if that's the case. So the first thing we did was just tell it to run ping against a, a server that, uh, that we host, and we watched for the DNS lookup. And so sure enough, we see the DNS lookup. It's like, uh, we should have uh, arbitrary Python code execution. And so Metasploit actually has a module for uh, delivering a meterpreter payload via Python. So we just used that, spun it up on our external uh, VPS server uh, through the payload at, at this guy, and sure enough, we, we got um, a interpreter. So we were on what appeared to be a, an internal server, um, not necessarily on what looked like a DMZ, because we, had, we could see a lot of stuff. Uh, so one of the first things that we did was just run TCP dump for, for everything that was not uh, destined for, for that for that host. So we get a little bit of good recon information about that internal network. And so one of the things that, uh, that we specifically look for to help identify the uh, domain related information was DHCP. Anyone know like what we might be able to see in DHCP? Two key things. So we get name servers and we get the NetBIOS version of the 
domain. So if it's like uh, company x.com, then their uh, then their NetBIOS name might be like uh, CPX. You know, it's a short short version. Um, so we, we we needed that information to identify where their domain controllers might be, so we can target those specifically. So this was a particularly interesting one. So we used uh, the, that tool I wrote, um, uh, LDAP for Dan. We enumerate via Active Directory all the user accounts, and you need a valid set of credentials to uh, query LDAP, but any credentials within the domain will work. So we tried all the credentials that we had uh, from the SQL dump uh, from the web application, and sure enough, not only did the ones we used to compromise that web application via Python, they worked, uh, but we actually had a domain admin's password that was the same as that web application SQL dump for Active Directory. So we were able to immediately authenticate as a domain admin. So at that point, it was basically game over. We pilfered a bunch of interesting data, their source code, uh, large government contracts, and, and data marked as confidential, and yada, yada. The interesting thing was that the client had no idea that that component of the web application which ran the Python code was even attached to their internal network. He's like, oh yeah, that shouldn't be the case. I'm like, well, yeah, shit, no, it's not supposed to be the case. So that was an eye opener. But for me, this is one of those uh, stories that helps really solidify the difference between a vulnerability assessment and a penetration test. And again, I don't, I don't care at the end of the day what you call it. You know, depending on the specific scope and uh, methods that we'll use, it's everything from a pen test to a red team engagement, but, you know, uh, offensive services. So if you look at what would happen in a typical vulnerability assessment, they would have gotten to the point where they said, hey, we identified a SQL injection vulnerability. You need to fix that. And that would have been it. That would be the end of the story. They'd say, okay, well, what's the real risk to our organization? And they might even base it solely on what's in that application and say, oh, you know what? This has public test data. It's meaningless. If a, if a hacker were able to uh, gain access to everything in that SQL database, we really don't care. And they, they might not, uh, you know, maybe they'll patch it, maybe they don't, but it doesn't necessarily change these other practices that we can't identify unless we continue to do the same exact things that a real-world attacker would do, like crack the passwords and see where else those passwords are being utilized. So again, we never would have uh, identified that they have very poor password practices if we didn't uh, take that information and continue on with it. And that, to me, is, the, again, the, the number one difference beyond the, the quintessential answer of, uh, you know, in a pen test, you exploit vulnerabilities, and in a vulnerability assessment, you don't. This really drives on that point that it's far beyond that. It's far beyond just exploiting vulnerabilities in Cloud Field. For, like, a big red team, though, you might have somebody who just, or maybe, like, two guys in the red team who just do, like, network mapping and vulnerability scanning, though, and then you would probably go and take that data from your red team members and go run exploits and vulnerabilities, though, like, yeah, depending on the engagement, I'm not saying that you wouldn't use a vulnerability scanner or anything like that. Right. What I'm saying is that in a vulnerability assessment... It, it stops after the scanner. Exactly. Yeah, the, their, ultimate, uh, their ultimate goal is to just identify as many vulnerabilities as possible, but you don't understand the real risk and what an attacker would really do if those vulnerabilities remain open. And so again, this highlights that that organization might continue to develop software with SQL injection vulnerabilities. But now they understand that it can be greatly exacerbated if they don't have unique passwords for each of their systems. So again, we're driving home uh, things that we might not otherwise be able to identify. And so again, you, you take it a step further and you say, during a vulnerability assessment, maybe you did even uncover that and you said, oh, you know what? Make sure you instruct all of your people to not reuse passwords. And so, fair enough, maybe that does even have some impact at that organization. But we demonstrate the real impact, and we do change attitudes because we have conversations with all those admins afterwards, and we say, this is why it's so bad. This one little vulnerability in your web application leads me to everything you care about. And so that behavior needs to change. And so, sure enough, not only did that change, but uh, some other serious things. Yep. So, on to that. So, we're kind of developing into the scheme where we don't use different passwords for different systems. We use SSO now. So where would you say that the behavior change should occur with Cloud Case that use SSO rather than different Man, operations? you want to just go right down that rabbit hole, don't you? Yeah, I do. So let, let's come back to that because it, it, there's so much of that. But I would say the short answer is it comes down to two things. One, compensating controls and defensive depth. 
So if you can do uh, multi-factor authentication, then clearly you should be doing that. But two, and more importantly, is using SSO in related applications seems fine. The problem here was it was an external web application with junk data. So why ever have the same authentication uh, capabilities as something that you really care about, like your internal servers that control the domain and have access to all your data? To all your data. That's the big thing. So but if you want, you can come back to it, because it's a whole, we had that conversation for I mean, like five I, hours. I'll tell you about why I asked the question. Cool. After. Yeah, great, cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the next slide is our daily double. First person to tell me what this is from gets a free ticket. <laughs> well, who said it? Yes. All right. It has nothing to do with anything, but I figured, you know, for a, for a free ticket. Do you think you can make it in, uh, in June? If not, you can always, like, sell it or, or give it away. But I think I can give it away. Cool. Awesome. All right, please do then. All right. So um, any other questions about... That uh, software company external? Cool. Okay, so the final one we did, and I think you guys might like this, there's some uh, cool similarities to what you guys were talking about, um, is that we were uh, contracted, and again, this is ongoing, uh, Monday morning, uh, when I get back to the office, uh, we're going to take what we hope to be the, the final step in exploitation of this guy. Uh, but so the first step for us was to go, uh, I've never done a thick client before. I've done plenty of web applications, we do a ton. And I've played with stuff related to uh, client-side software, but I've never specifically been contracted to target a very specialized thick client. And so, um, you know, this was a great learning experience for us. And so, honestly, one of the things I love most about pen testing is that literally a test does not go by where I don't learn something new. You know what I mean? No matter how, no. I've been doing this for, I don't know, uh, professionally, uh, I think almost 18 years. Um, more as a hobby. I still, every single time, learn something new. That's what I love about this field. Uh, so anyway, this was a whole new world. It was like, okay, cool, we're going to get to do a, uh, a Windows-based uh, thick client application. Um, did some research on it initially to see what other folks had done, and there isn't a lot out there. Um, it seemed like there was maybe one or two decent papers, but it was all the obvious stuff about uh, debugging, decompiling, reverse engineering, and all that stuff. And, and, and it didn't get into uh, what I hope to be you know, a little more uh, specific things to, to testing thick client applications. Uh, so we started with the obvious stuff, uh, mapping the application, uh, discovered a tool that was new to me, API Monitor, which was an awesome tool. It allows you to look at all the different API calls uh, made from that application, and you can uh, narrow it down based on specific categories like crypto, encryption, hashing, uh, compression, uh, other areas. And so clearly we started with uh, things like uh, authentication and crypto. But anyway, I digress. And so we mapped it. Um, it's a very, very basic application. It actually does, it does a very, very small number of things very quickly and very well. And it's all related to uh, gigantic stockpiles of data. And so the interesting thing is that it's a read-only application, though. So it only asks the server for information, displays it to the user, and that's it. And so that attack service seemed relatively limited to us. Uh, so one of the first things we wanted to do was look at this network protocol and see if it used some sort of standard. Um, so the, the first thing we learned um, after uh, grabbing the, uh, the network traffic was that it exchanges RSA keys. So it exchanges public keys from the server and from the client. And then, excuse me, then after that, everything was in clear text. So we literally only cared about uh, utilizing that to authenticate the user. And so we identified early on that it was an MD5 hash with a... Uh, with a, a assault. Um, unfortunately, one of the interesting things was that the application handled that internally and did not use an external DLL. So that made it kind of uh, obnoxious to find quickly, uh, but we were able to identify um, early on, based on the data it sent to the crypt encrypt function, which was part of the Windows API, what looked like a hash. And the way we did that was we authenticated as user and I grabbed that via API monitor and said, okay, this is the whole call to crypt encrypt. This is what gets encrypted and sent over the network. And then we tried a password that only had a one character difference. And we noticed the blob that uh, changed matched the length requirement of an MD5 hash. So that's how we quickly identified, okay, it's probably doing MD5. And it's probably doing it internally to the application and not via DLL. 
uh, because it's not making any calls to, to, uh, to an API that we're watching. Uh, so anyway, that was interesting. Um, we clearly alerted the client right away. You know, we have a, a, an on ongoing, uh, we, we alert them to issues as we find them. Um, a, to just get feedback and say, does this jive with what you guys believe to be the case? And, and you know, so we're not wasting our time spinning our wheels. Um, so it gets, gets worse. Um, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're aware of that because we have encryption turned off right now on the network side. Because we typically force users to go over a VPN, we basically rely on that. We have the, the capabilities within the application to encrypt network traffic. Let us turn that on. You guys can focus on that. So they turned it on, and uh, uh, base palm across across different user sessions. It uses the same session key. Anyone see any issues with that? Can anyone explain what the issue is? Yes. Short answer, encryption is completely moot. So if I can decrypt any traffic from any other user, because we all share the same session key, what are you talking about? That's not encryption. So we identified that early on, and then also identified as part of that process that they use the same IV. Anyone know what the IV stands for and does? <laughs> all right, you all know that one. Yeah, initialization vector. And so not only did they use the same IV across all sessions, guess what it was? Zero. All zeros. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so if I have time, I'll tell you the most hilarious story um, after this. What time we got? But... Uh, but yeah, that, so those two uh, design decisions were something that we never ever would have expected. It's like, this is the most basic thing, like give your users unique session keys. Yeah, anyway, I digress. Let me break here. There we go. Okay, so then uh, so we, we know that there's issues with the encryption, and they're still working on uh, figuring out that issue and patching it. But we wanted to understand the actual content of the packet. So we know we can read it in clear text, but we've got to understand it because it ultimately looks uh, a lot like binary data with some ASCII text in there, and it's hard to really understand what's happening between the client and server. Um, so the first thing I did um, years and years ago, I wrote a bunch of programs uh, using libpcap in C uh, to sniff traffic. Uh, so dusted off the cobwebs on that stuff. Uh, wrote a, a quick, easy thing to uh, basically read in a PCAP, print out the relevant components of, that, uh, of the TCP data, and that allowed us to create a C structure to say, you know what, these four bytes look like they're related to this, and we'll print it out this way. These, these bytes look like this. And it was actually a really quick process for us to identify the inner workings of this protocol. And so, uh, frankly, one of the people um, that I was working with on this, he's Super smart, he picked up on some stuff really quick. And we noticed a, a header that was consistent across all communication between these, the, the client and the server. So it was really obvious which packets we care about. Uh, so there was always like this, this magic header. And then after that, like uh, the first eight or 10 bytes, it got into chunks that would you know, cycle through all these different values. But by creating that program and printing the, out the areas we cared about, it was it, it, we were able to very, very quickly see the patterns in those. And so the patterns that we saw were things like okay, the, the, the client requests a data by filling in these fields, and it has these other fields set to zeros, and then when the server responds, it fills in those fields with its values, but it's the client's values match. And so we're able to quickly identify things like, and I think, what was it? Control commands, so where, the, where the, the, the client was making the decision, I want this thing, this blob of data, and this is the, the control number for it. And so most of that was in uh, 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 two bytes. And so it would be simple things like, you know, number seven, number eight. And it would go through a series while it authenticated, cycling through these different what we thought were commands. We also quickly identified that in addition to the, to the TCP sequence and acknowledge, acknowledgement numbers, it had its own internal component for that. So the client will go through, and for each unique request it makes, it just basically... Um, uh, increments this two byte word by one. And so we're getting a good, good idea of what this, uh, 
what this communication pattern looks like. I request this data, my, my client side sequence number is 20, I request the data from the server, it tells me its sequence number, which is 423, and then, okay, when I get that back, I respond again, say, okay, now my sequence number is 21, and so we can see this really uh, easy exchange uh, happening. And so we had a, a quick conversation with the client, we said, hey, this is what we're seeing, we wanna make sure this jives with, with, uh, with your expectations of the protocol, and basically what we got is, eh, it kinda sounds right, but it's all proprietary, we're not going to acknowledge or, or disconfirm what you are telling us, so it kinda sucks, but anyway, um, as you can see, it didn't really make a difference. So next we wanted to move on re uh, to replaying packets. So we think we understand the general structure for making requests from the client to the server. Now we want to see if we can forge those requests for a couple different reasons. Not the least of which is if I can take a high privileged user, sniff that traffic, again all of the session keys are the same so I can decrypt it, and replay that to the server as a less privileged user, will I get back that sensitive privileged data? And so we had to, we did a lot of research to identify an existing tool that would work to do this. Um, and we found the only one that looked like it was, uh, there, there, were, there were kind of two. And we threw Ethercap out because um, that was a mess the last time I tried to use it years and years ago. It just never was great about manipulating uh, packets in real time. And so there was one uh, burp nope extension, uh, no HTTP proxy extension, something like that, um, which looked really promising. Uh, we've got burp pro licenses, so we threw it in, uh, but no go is like a, a kind of a headache. We spent like a day trying to get to work and it's just, just not doing what we needed it to do. Um, and there was a professional uh, something that was built like kind of to look like Wireshark, uh, but it was, it was a, a, they had a free trial version, which didn't really seem to work, and, uh, and it was just a hassle to use. So we said, screw it, let's just try to write, write our own thing. Um, and so the first thing we did was we utilized the program I wrote in C to just implement the write functionality so that we could read in packets that we captured from a PCAP and just replay them. And so this was an, an awesome learning experience. I used to teach uh, CCNA years and years ago, and we get deep into, you know, uh, uh, TCP uh, connections and all that. And so it was crazy to revisit all that information and put it to, to practical use. And so there are things that you know, were, were you know, completely new to me and, and that uh, I had to relearn uh, to implement something like this. Uh, so the first was uh, dealing with uh, the sequence numbers and the acknowledgement numbers to get them to jive. Because if we captured those, uh, those requests from the valid client, those specific TCP uh, sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers would no longer work. So we had to uh, set up a live TCP connection and edit those to uh, match what they should be. So using uh, the Linux, I think we used the hex editor command, which I think was prettier than hex edit, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Again, hopefully there will be a white paper after this. Uh, but we utilized that to just uh, mark a couple of specific bytes, change those manually, piped it into our program, replayed the packet, and Eureka, we can get, uh, we can replay any packet that we capture to the server, and it will re respond with that legitimate data back to us. Uh, so that was pretty awesome. So, so again, it's similar to what uh, you guys were, were doing with the, with the alarm from a network perspective, is that we can just, you know, wait, sniff this stuff, and, uh, and replay it uh, across any TCP set session, and we're good. So the problem is, is that, that was way too onerous. You know, we can't go through and, and manually hex edit all these packets to get the type of uh, attack scenario that we want. You know, basically what we're trying to do now is uh, change the privilege response from the server, instructing the client, hey, you have access to this type of functionality within the interface, be interface because some of the, some of the menu options are grayed out for the lower privileged users. Uh, so we want to see, if, is there an easy way to spoof that response from the server and vice versa? Uh, to make both parties think that we have more privileges than we do. And so we can't do that manually. And so we did a ton of research, and the best option looked like Scappy. And I, was, I, I never learned uh, Python before this engagement. Um, always makes me feel like an old fogey, but I use C, Perl, that generally accomplishes everything I wanted to, um, and I was really reluctant to, to learn Python until I learned Python, and it is freaking awesome. 
the, the thing that like was the, the big eye opener was when I needed to search an array for a specific value, which in Python is a single line of code, and in C it would have been like probably 10 or, or 15, depending on what I need to do, or more. And I was like, literally, I'm like looking around the keyboard, like, ooh, I feel so dirty, like this is, this is phenomenal. <laughs> so if you don't know Python, learn Python, it's freaking phenomenal. Uh, so this specific module, NFQ, which was also new to me, is a way to uh, instruct IP tables to pause specific packets and only forward them or drop them based on your manipulation of that queue. So again, I don't have a perfect understanding of NFQ. That's kind of like dumbed down version of it. Um, it's new to me. We're still working on it. Um, but we did, uh, now that we have that capability, we can edit packets in real time using uh, Python and Scappy. So we, we, I will at least post you know, a very uh, generic version of these uh, programs and scripts um, so that hopefully other people can find good use from them for them. Um, but uh, uh, we were able to use uh, all of the, the basic uh, functions within uh, Scappy to flip the, the, the bits around that, that we need to, uh, to attempt to do uh, specific things. And the best part about that is that by doing it that way on live packets, we don't need to muck with sequence and acknowledgement numbers because we're just changing valid packets. So again, we're sniffing a packet from the client that says, hey, I'm, I'm Tyler, I'm trying to log in. Server's gonna respond and say, okay, Tyler, you're good to go, but you're a low privilege user. We're trying to change that and say you're a high privilege user and see what happens. Uh, so anyway, uh, we tried that. Um, we're in the beginning stages of that, but we see, we've seen success uh, mucking with the data, requesting legitimate data. We, we get it back to support, gesundheit. Um, so we think that we are right on the cusp of being able to basically uh, access uh, any data within this application with uh, with any user. So uh, that was unique for a bajillion reasons, uh, most of which I just covered. But again, hopefully I'll uh, have a white paper out soon. Um, yeah, so other than that, that's all I got. Uh, if you guys have any specific questions. Yep. you ever get to use your grappling hook? No, still have not used my Jeez. grappling hook. <laughs> yep, yep. Close, uh, close one time to that, but uh, <laughs> decided not to break my ankles. So, yeah, good question. Did you have a question? I was just going to add a book you're reading less about the Demon Sermon on the Martial Arts. The Demon Sermon? On the Martial Arts, yes. Cool, all right. File that one away. Gracias. All right, cool, anyone else? Awesome, thanks guys. Thank you.